Hello, welcome to another episode of The Podiatry Detectives with Sherlock and Colombo. Say hello, Colombo. Hi, Sherlock. How are you? I, I am Poker. I am top of the world. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad at all. Um, how is life treating you at the moment? Not bad. Busy, busy, busy with um, university stuff, um, podcasting, making these videos. Um, I always have a meeting with the movement therapy clinic. Some of our therapists, we get together every morning and we set goals and uh, for us to do throughout the day, which has been really helpful. Which has been really, really I've helpful. Heard you have heard some great stuff about movement therapy clinic. Um, hopefully I can get to introduce me to them one day, but they, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds like it's an awesome place to work at. It is. Um, I think I'll tell you why it's an awesome place to actually work at because uh, um, it's very progressive. Um, they like all the people who work there um, are very like-minded people who love education, um, love the um, the best sort of knowledge which is out there, and uh, keep searching and learning for more. And uh, we've got in, t in our team, we've got um, an osteopath who is the clinical director. Um, We've got um, a couple of physiotherapists, we've got a sports therapist, we've got strength and conditioning coaches, um, and uh, there's myself in there. We've got an access to uh, a gym. It's a real MDT team, then, isn't it? It's a pro it's a it's an MDT team in, in yeah. practice. MDT team, especially focusing toward uh, helping people with regards to musculoskeletal sort of issues. Uh, um, so, so yeah, it's a it's a brilliant place to be at and and work at. As you can actually see, I've got a. a yeah, I can see. I can see you advertising them. I'm advertising like Ralph Lauren here. So <laughs> I think Ralph Lauren should pay me a little bit for like wearing this shirt. Um, so come today, got, how come you've got a shirt on? How come you've got a doctor foot? Uh, uh, doctor foot. Oh, I, I, I had a I had a patient today this morning. Yeah, so um, I had a patient who was gardening and put a nail in their foot and didn't want to go to A&E mm -hmm. and rang me up and just pleaded and I said, all right, fine. So I gave a couple of, look, I gave a, gave a couple of injections and I took the nail out, which is quite satisfying actually. Um, but people, and I had to go to the patient, I go, the A&E is still a safe place to go, but people are scared to go to A&E because they think they're going to contract COVID. So I, I think a lot of people that, I mean, we should never be seeing a patient with a nail in their foot. This is not for people like you and me. Um, and I only did it because he pleaded, um, because he, didn't, he really didn't want to go to a &E. But this is a, this is a it's, it's a wider issue, because I think a lot of people are not going in for heart attacks and strokes and injuries. And I think people are managed, and I think the mortality rate is increasing for other things. So it just goes to show that COVID can have a wider implication on health, which it is an from my experience this morning. Um, well, not if, if you me. ask me personally, if you ask me what I've been, um, I'm a healthcare professional who understands uh, uh, the background of uh, COVID-19 and all these sort of things. But uh, if you ask me that if you've got something and would I go to any, I wouldn't go to any. And I think it's, a, it's like we all are scared and we all are uh, worried and uh, what we watch on the news and all these things have an impact, doesn't it? Yeah, that, that fear I factor. I agree with you. They are a safe place uh, and uh, people, are, yeah. people are doing an amazing <laughs> job to keep it safe. They have separated people that are potential. I mean, they, they do get triaged very quickly as soon as they walk in. And if they have any COVID symptoms, um, then they get put in a different place. But I think the fear, and as this patient was telling me this morning, was they could somebody could be in the waiting room that's asymptomatic, but shits burst but still a uh, shedding virus. Um, and that's the, that's the different thing about this particular virus that you could be asymptomatic at the time and you could still infect others. But um, we are going to do, I, th I, th I think it would be worth doing a separate show just on that. And I actually, I think what it's worth doing is I, I will put up the emails that I'm getting every day and a substantial amount of emails. And I'll, obviously I will take the person's name out and we're going to go through all the all of these COVID running injuries that people are getting uh, right now, and I'll go through some of the responses that I gave, and some of, and, and we can talk about that too, because there's a lot of people that are starting to t 
take their health and fitness and well-being a lot more seriously. So, for example, vitamin sales have gone through the roof. <laughs> through the roof. People are buying because now they think, oh, I've got to take care of my body. Uh, uh, sales for home exercise equipment through the roof. Um, uh, and people are running a lot more, hell of a lot more. So I'm getting loads of I think it'd be interesting to talk about, we could call it COVID, COVID running injuries or something like that. Well, I, 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 load. I was going to come to that. Uh, where uh, um, Ian Griffith, one of uh, our uh, podiatry sports guru, I kind of look up to him um, and he introduced uh, um, off the cuff um, term called like COVID load. And I thought that's, that's really good. That is amazing because uh, I don't need to look at anybody else, uh, even myself. What I have started doing uh, recently is that I've started running three times a week, which is like 15K, which um, uh, six to eight weeks ago I wasn't doing. But luckily we were doing um, in Harbon, we were uh, running a couch to 5K program and I was leading it. So hence why I was a bit more um, ready to go and uh, do three runs. Um, I've started doing strength training. I've started doing uh, um, just general walks. Uh, so my load um, because of COVID-19 has increased and I can easily say it's probably increased four times uh, what yeah. I was actually doing. Uh, well, that's happening a lot around the UK, isn't it? People are taking up a lot of activity. Griff's a good guy. Um, I, I do think we should talk about this at, at some other stage and I think we'll go into detail about it. But before we start today's episode, which is about Morton's neuroma, don't, don't worry, we will talk about what it is, and other forefoot conditions, um, let's start off with the compulsory putting Tosif on the spot, making him squirm right. in the chair. Let's learn more about Mr. Tosif. So today's question, all right, and I'm going to start moving these slowly from PG to adult related <laughs> questions slowly. So today's question. I'll well, put you on the spot. Next, I've got my kids next door. So, <laughs> <laughs> so today's question is, give, who is your favourite UK music artist or group? Right. Now, I, I must say that I'm not a big uh, music person. Um, <clears throat> Whose uh, who's songs that I've actually listened to in recent time? I can easily say Ed Sheeran. Uh, but don't ask me which song. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you to sing a song from Ed Sheeran now. Forget oh, no, <laughs> it. Get your guitar in there. On that, I'll tell you a story about uh, what um, Abdullah, who's my oldest son, he said to me. Uh, I'm sitting downstairs and uh, I tried uh, to, to sing a few lines and he goes, Daddy, can you please stop singing? I said, <laughs> and he goes, Oh, you just cannot sing. And I said, well, how am I going to improve if you're not going to let me practice? And he goes, Daddy, can you practice in the shower or in your car, please? That's how good I am. That's how good you are. Okay. Maybe I won't let our listeners and viewers listen to you sing then. Great. Okay. Can we start? Um, what about you? What about me? Like, uh, who's your favorite singer? I like somebody that I don't think you'll even know who he is. He's a young guy from London called uh, Dave. Uh, Dave's an awesome singer. He's from Streatham. He's sung a song called Black. He's my currently. He's my. He's somebody I really, I really like because he's um, his music is a lot more different. But I, I mean, I love R and B and hip hop. I'm a massive hip hop fan. Can you, can but, you look at they spit off uh, uh, that song? I cannot give you a taster <laughs> right now because although I'm not as bad as you. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not great. Uh, just bear with me a second. I am. Try, how do I play this slideshow? Yeah, that's it. Hey, hey. All right. Today, 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 today. We are going to be talking about Morton's neuroma and other forefoot conditions. The reason why, I, reason why we put Morton's neuroma first is, Dorsey so will agree, out of all the forefoot conditions, it's the one that we most commonly see. So we're going to talk about that in a, little, in, in a bit more detail, but we are going to talk about some of the other foot, foot, four foot conditions too. Yep. So let's leave Morton's neuroma to one side, Tosif, because we're going to focus on that. 
<laughs> tell me, before I speak about Capture Lightless and Plant to Plate Tears, tell me what you think about Capture Lightless. How does it normally present? Now, Capture Lightless is, um, well, ITIS, as we previously basically mentioned in our um, other uh, uh, videos, ITIS means inflammation, and capsule is um, a little capsule around the joint. Uh, which gets inflamed uh, due to repetitive traumas, due to, um, I personally, I've seen it more in uh, inflammatory conditions because uh, they affect the capsule, they affect the synovium of the joints and their inflammatory conditions of the joints. So I've seen it, my personal experience has been a lot toward uh, with the inflammatory conditions. But yeah, I have seen them otherwise uh, in terms of uh, uh, active individuals who are running around and uh, um, like hammering their uh, second MTPJ predominantly. Um, and that's when uh, it starts basically for me. What about okay, you? So let's, let's take this back a couple of steps. First of all, um, capsulitis is you'll have a sharp pain under the ball of your foot. It's most commonly the second metatarsal. So if you find your second toe, and if you go underneath that, that's your second metatarsal. It's commonly there. Um, and it will be, when we palpate it, we can test if it is the actual capsule or not. Um, it doesn't get picked up on ultrasound great. You can sometimes get some neovascularization, which is some blood vessels around, but it's very hard to pick up. It can it can get picked up on MRI, but I don't know anybody that's sent off on MRI unless you're an elite athlete. Mm -hmm. um, we, I mean, I'm going to speak about this a bit later, but I think capsulitis and plantar plate tear has a very close relationship between them because um, I think it's often a precursor to a plantar plate, to a plantar plate tear. Our demographics have been slightly different. So I've, obviously I don't treat... Um, um, uh, people that have got inflammatory arthritis. I treat runners, it will, although I hate running myself because I can't, I hate it, but I treat millions of runners and this is something very commonly seen with runners. Um, I have never seen it in a third, fourth metatarsal. I don't know about you. No, you ever... yeah, I think it's very common with the second, but I haven't seen anybody with the, with the third um, or fourth at all. Um, let's talk to me about how you would treat it. Um, with regards to the plantar plate tear and uh, oh, capsulitis, tell me how you. Yeah. In, um, I just means um, inflammation. So first of all, you gotta rest it. Um, I use taping. Taping helps quite uh, quite well because uh, you can just tape the toe downward so that the stretching of the capsule is uh, is reduced and limited, um, and hence why you not constantly keep pulling. Um, offload it with um, orthotic that, that takes the pressure off from uh, the capsule that aids and helps with the um, treatment for my rheumatoid or inflammatory patients they probably go on to um, NSA non-steroid uh, anti-inflammatories uh, and other medication to reduce the inflammation. Is that a tablet or see? It is a tablet yeah um, but you can um, you can use an injection but it's not a very common one um okay i inject it quite a bit but i do everything else that you say um sometimes as i said my demographic tends to be a bit different uh active people that are preparing for some sort of run or a football match or a hockey match or rugby match i'm seeing so many different sports so sometimes i might fast track the process mm -hmm. but everything else i would completely agree with you i would do exactly what you said now, plantar plate, it's important to understand what a plantar plate is. It's the distal tension load bearing extension of the plantar fascia. Hey, you've got a foot. I went to the clinic yesterday just to mm. make my foot. I was jealous that you had a foot in your hand uh, when you were. I don't have a foot. I've only got my real foot now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I, we are, well, I'm, I'm going to have to go. On. There you, you go. Talk about it. I'll uh, demonstrate it on the video. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to. Talk, briefly talk about the plantar plate. Now, what people don't talk about with the plantar fascia, which is the structure that supports the underside of the foot, is that the plantar fascia, the deeper slips, go in to the plantar plate. Mm -hmm. So the plantar plate is an important distant load-bearing extension of the plantar fascia. Absolutely. And now I think, now this is not proven, I don't know where, this is more my experience. I think oftentimes patients present with the capsulitis, it's not treated properly, 
and that progresses towards a plantar plate tear. Initially, when you have a plantar plate damage, you treat it exactly the same way you would treat capsulitis. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to treat this quickly because your toe will quickly go from being straight to being bent. It'll go off in a direction like somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very important that you catch it early. Um, now, so Steve, we know that certain runners that change their running mechanics because they've read a magazine to tell them that they can get quicker and they go to four foot running, which if you have done that, you're an idiot. All right, but if you've done, you shouldn't do that. You should not change your running mechanics. Um, and those people that have drastically gone from a maximally supportive shoe, I'm thinking about a Brooks or an Asics 2000s, something with that's got that's got support and it's got a higher pitch, to something that's flatter with a lower pitch, and they're putting more strain on the forefoot. Those runners can get both of those conditions can't they yes they can um, i've got a slightly different take i don't know whether it's right or wrong uh, with regards to changing the running mechanics is that personally i don't really stop patients from doing things that they want to do, um, I do. and the reason is uh, the re reason is is that uh, i think if they train gradually and if they um do it methodologically uh, they can get there, uh, but okay. So obviously, I agree with you, and this is something that we're going to talk about on another episode about about like about like a stride length, about um, lumbar pelvic control, all of that, all of those to even like uh, even like arm swing, uh, and and your and your torso position. I completely agree with improving the efficiency of your running mechanics. I where I find a problem is if you are a rear foot striker mm -hmm. and you want to go to a four foot strike, not because not because of a a foot problem or a leg problem or like a pathology, just because you want to get faster, I think this that can lead to both of those two conditions. And that's where I think we may differ with our approach because I would be quite militant and say, you know, what are you doing? Um I think for me, I think uh, if somebody is like that um, and they're trialing different things and they want to basically test, test different things uh, whether they can or they can't do it, then um, I would much rather let them try it in a very safe way. But uh, if they are a rare for, um, runners, they very soon will figure it out. They very soon, the body will tell them, right, yeah. you can't do it. You just cannot do it. Although that, that can happen. That can lead to our third, our fourth item there, which is stress fractures. But we'll talk yeah, about that in a absolutely. minute. Absolutely. So um, I, I think uh, as long as they don't go absolutely mad about it uh, um, and um, like straight away they're running uh, uh, 15k, 20k on a spot, and uh, one day with the wake up and they say, right, I'm going to be running I'm, four foot for 20k, then that's uh, that's absolutely plain and uh, stupid. What I would, how, how, I would. Um, I disagree with you. I respectfully disagree with you because I think if they are, if the purpose of them moving to a four foot strike is to get, it's so it's always going back to the purpose. What is their purpose of going to a four? Foot Absolutely. Strike? Is it to is it to run faster? If it's to run faster, we need to start thinking about nutrition, stress, Absolutely. sleep patterns. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Run, slow runs. We need to start thinking about a lot more stuff than just changing your foot strike. Yes, but, so, but, but I, I'm not disagreeing with you on that uh, front at all. What I'm uh, kind of saying, my approach to um, if somebody wants to do something, I'm not going to stand in their way and say to them that, no, you can't do it. I can advise them that it's not a good advice. Uh, it's not a good uh, idea. But I don't like to stand in their way. And uh, what I would probably do is that I would say, right, that's what you want to do. I don't think it will help. But if you want to try it, this is the safe way to try it. And that's where I believe it. Uh, that's my my approach to it. Let's move on. Is there anything else that I've missed out with the plantar plate tear? No, I think I think we've covered the, we've covered okay. the, pretty much uh, you, in you terms of in orthotics are very very important for this for both of those conditions. We need to offload 
the metatarsal that's affected, often the second, but we need to try and take the weight off it as much as possible. And obviously, where we, we, we may address footwear as well. Is there anything else, sorry, you were going to back to say something? So what I was uh, going to say is that um, people who have like bunions, people who have like a hallux, functional hallux limitus or uh, hallux rigidus and stuff like that, they start to propulse from the second toe. So they start to kind of move off from the second toe, don't they? That yeah. can be one of the risk factors. And um, in my um, orthotic therapy, when I'm, um, if I find these things, that's what I try to correct as well. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so uh, metatarsalgia, which generally is a BS term that's not used in podiatry, but those podiatrists that are using it, hang your heads in shame. Um, but it's often used in the public, which is why I have put it there. Yeah. Metatarsalgia basically means just pain, tenderness in the wall of the foot. Yep. It's not a diagnosis. It just doesn't tell you how to treat it. It doesn't tell you nothing. Um, um, it, if somebody phones me up and says, I've got metatarsalgia, I'll say, I've got a right arm. <laughs> well done. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Is there anything else you want to add to metatarsalgia? Not at all. It's an umbrella term, which uh, yeah, anything, it is an umbrella. Even all the things that we've actually got listed there, um, they can all come under metatarsalgia, can't they? Okay, I'm going to let you talk about stress fractures. So again, stress fractures, we talked about uh, plantar plate tear and what are the things that could actually contribute to it. It's the loading um, that uh, if you've got um, sort of uh, excessive loading on a repetitive uh, um, scenario for a long period of time, be it uh, from running, be it from other activities, um, footwear where you mentioned that if you're used to wearing the um, footwear which has got a nice thick sort of sole into it now you've gone on to minimalistic footwear or you're running barefooted um, all these things increase increases the stresses uh, into the metatarsal biomechanical abnormalities we talked about which is hallux limitus rigidus uh, where the big toe doesn't really allow the propulsion to take place second toe being longer than the first toe encourages the uh, you to towing off from the second as well. Um, so all these things uh, have an impact. Increase the loading on your, uh, increase the stresses on your second MTPJ. Now, looking at it from the lateral uh, side of the, the uh, a lack of uh, vitamin D um, is another. So if you if you loan vitamin D, that can uh, be a contributing factor. Um, being uh, ladies are more prone to. Would you agree? as compared to the men um yeah that's uh, that's a much deeper deeper talk uh, but uh, we we will touch up, we will like touch upon that yeah a bit later. osteoporosis and um i'm, I'm not sure about like a, i've read it somewhere is that b12 deficiency can contribute to it but i'm uh, not uh, i can't not read really uh, vitamin d okay. deficiency um so i'm gonna look this is something that we're gonna speak a lot about when we talk about uh, media tibial stress syndrome, mm -hmm. um, which will be one of our talks in the next in the next week or two, next couple of weeks. Um, with a stress fracture, you don't just get a stress fracture. So you'll get um, you'll get edema, which is like swelling first. So you, that'll be, and then you'll that'll be around the bone first, and then you'll get it inside the bone into cortical, and then. Over time, that will spread to other parts of the metatarsal, and then you'll get a stress fracture. Within, when we talk about medial tibial stress syndrome, also known as shin splints, I hate that word. Um, we talk about um, the like uh, Fred. There's a like Fredrickson classification for yep. medial tibial stress syndrome. Um, I don't know if there is one for for second metatarsals, sure. but so Steve touched upon females. There are many different factors for females we call it the uh, the like red s and um, it's where females that are, have got uh, like irregular um periods uh calories matter if they're not consuming enough calories and then there's a lot of other things like a metabolic endocrine psychological there's a f um, smoking age osteochondrosis there's a lot of other factors but what this is another talk for, for a different time. This is something that can happen in the second metatarsal. 
which is very important if you've got pain in the ball of the foot. Don't call it metatarsalgia and buy a pad from the internet. Go and see a podiatrist because we'll be able to assess it. Um, one of my evil ways of assessing it actually is I get a like um, I get like a tuning fork and I put it on the foot. Uh, so if it if it if it like if it like vibrates, it's very painful on a thing. So that's that's how I check it. Um, well, it, it doesn't get. I, I must say that uh, I do the same. Um, yeah. I've had several positive sort of results, a uh, um, few negatives as well. And uh, that made me think about one thing. Now, we historically learned about it when we were at uni and uh, I've never re really digged into it to figure out how reliable that test is in the clinical setting. So I think one of the things, I don't know about you, whether you've come across any papers or anything uh, that says that yeah, it's very oh. reliable, but uh, I think I, it's something which I'm interested in, and I'm going to go back it's and one of our tricks of the trade. There, uh, there, is, there, is no there is there is no evidence to say this is a good way of testing. Uh, but can you still see me? I Hello. Can. Oh, okay, okay. He just said that uh, my internet internet connection was unstable. Um, but let's move on. Um, uh, Freiburg's osteochondrosis. I'm going to move through these two quite quickly because we've got a lot to cover and we've already gone 35 minutes into this. Uh, Freiburg's osteochondrosis is a condition often occurs in females in the second metatarsal. It's avascular uh, necrosis of the metatarsal head, which means the blood supply is affected to the metatarsal head. What often happens is when the female becomes older uh, and into their 20s and 30s they'll get this pain in the ball of the foot again uh, it'll be incorrectly di uh, diagnosed as metatarsalgia but when you see the x-ray the, met the metatarsal head won't be um, round sh show us your model again it's, with it's your model it flattened yeah. out from underneath yeah so it flattens out that's there um, it flattens out that's there so it's not round anymore um and it's often treated with orthotics and sometimes an injection. An intermetatarsal bursitis a bursa is a sac of fluid. It's, they are in between the metatarsals. Sometimes if you're doing some, if you're doing a sport right or an activity. In, uh, in between there, the joints. If you're doing something with a lot of like shearing forces and torsional forces. So uh, a golfer comes to mind here, can get this, it settles quite quickly with a steroid injection. Now let's move on we've got a lot to cover. Mortis neuroma. Now, yeah. we are focusing on mortis neuroma because we see this a lot. I'm going to briefly go through the slide and then we're going to have a chat. Uh, it's a nerve entrapment. Uh, occurs in women five times more likely than men. Wow. Pain in burning, tingling, numbness, more frequent between the third. I've seen it in the second, uh, uh, but normally between the third and fourth metatarsals. Now, so see, I wonder, you, uh, um, I wonder if high heels have got anything to play uh, with like five times more likely than, uh, than men. Yes, yes, that could be, that could be, <laughs> that could be a factor. It's something that we're going to come to later on. Uh, so, clinical presentation. Let's see, you, I want you to talk through this, so see. So what do you typically see and what test would you do? So usually speaking, um, when patient comes in and uh, they explain their pain, they are uh, explaining about like sharp shooting pain, um, which can radiate toward the toes or on the um, going toward the toes um, or going upwards. Um, and um, pain can be like tingling, numbing, um, sort of sensation. So early stages of Morton's neuroma presents with more. Uh, symptomatic uh, with activity or certain footwear and stuff like that um, as it basically becomes bigger and bigger so it's like a little fibroma on the nerve isn't it that's it's like thickening of the nerve the thicker it gets um, the more painful it is uh, and uh, the pain can be there all the time or the tingling can be there all the time um, in the clinical uh, sort of presentation early sort of signs are a bit difficult to kind of uh, generate that molders click. So molders click is when you grab the, um, grab the foot, you press it from the sideways, and then you 
uh, once you've pressed it with one uh, one hand then you use your thumb and you just basically push it upwards where you're suspecting the neuroma is and that produces a little click now it doesn't have to be positive to, for it to have a, a neuroma because uh, uh, early stages uh, the neuron like neuroma isn't thick enough for it to actually produce the click um, however um, now you and me have got ultrasound machine, which is amazing thing. Which we're we'll we'll gonna talk about that a bit later. Which, uh, um, which gives us uh, that extra sort of uh, ability to be able to uh, kind of identify and diagnose that um, a lot more easily, as well as uh, a lot more accurately. So, so that that's what I do in uh, in terms of the clinical uh, clinical setting. So I think I mean you've covered almost everything. Um, uh, if you, I mean, a lot of it is based on history, history, history. When yep. we ask about the symptoms, um, when if you squeeze the foot and if you know how, where to palpate, and if you're in between the metatarsals, you've got a fair idea. Um, and just squeezing it from the top and the bottom and putting some pressure on, um, it, it can give you a fair idea that it is a mortar neuroma. You'll, you'll often see that their footwear is not conducive and it's yep. either got high heels or, or they've got very narrow footwear. Um, now, Imaging. Uh, I'm going to talk about imaging a little bit. First of all, imaging, if I imaged 100 people, there may be 10 people that have got a neuroma that have got no pain. So there are a lot of people with asymptomatic neuromas, no discomfort at all. So it's not the only um, tool that we have in our toolbox, but it is an incredibly useful tool to visualize the actual neuroma measure the neuroma as you can see in these images you can actually do the test you can see it popping out of the you can see it popping in, in between the metatarsals mm -hmm. and this also helps to uh, differentiate between a a like a like a bursitis which will sometimes be further down and there'll be a lot more swelling within within the bursitis um is there anything else you want to add to imaging no no that's that's fine um yep yeah. Yep. Okay, treatments. Dorsif, tell me about treatments. Let's start with footwear, because we know this is probably one of the, one of the primary reasons. And it, I'm not just going to blame females here, because this a lot of this has got to do with um, with like running shoes as well, and men that are wearing very tight brogues. Let's talk about it. Right. Uh, well, uh, I, I was talking to Ian. Uh, at the running show and uh, we were talking about uh, Morton's neuromas and uh, he mentioned that he goes a lot of his patients um, wear brogues in London and uh, they're wearing smart clothes and uh, they come in with the Morton's neuroma and his main life of, line of uh, therapy is, uh, is injection therapy because uh, patients aren't willing to change their footwear and they just want to stay in their... Uh, Which Ian is this? Pardon? Which Ian is this? Ian Griffiths. Okay, Ian Griffith. Yeah. So the so footwear has got a massive role to play. Um, the the more the pinching of the side of the foot, uh, the more uh, the rubbing of the nerve, and the more thickening of the nerve that can actually happen due to that uh, um, that plays a part. High heels basically puts the foot into this sort of position where uh, you are not only uh, basically compressing it from the side you're putting the pressure from the top as well so a lot of forces are going through it running shoes again um, it is amazing how many people would actually come to us and uh, with their running issues and their running shoes do not fit them they find the shoe they know that they are eight and a half they buy the shoe over the internet because it's uh, on on sale and uh, they start wearing it um, so one of the things which uh, I've started asking my patients is that uh, have they bought the shoe online or have they bought the shoe from uh, from uh, the shop where they fitted it for them and uh, what that tells me is that if they've bought it online I do check the fitting um, I check the fitting for everybody but I'm I pay more attention to fitting and uh, I've seen it several times when patients are basically they've got a certain type of foot which is very splayed, wide, uh, wide forefoot, and then the shoe that they're wearing uh, to run in is quite narrow and um, not the exact size. So, so that's that's my experience on it. Okay, I think you've covered everything. Um, 
first of all, those 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 like those like men's shoes are very nice. I would wear them as well. So uh, I've got three. <laughs> I, I three they, they, they look beautiful. Now I would I would go back to running shoes. Okay, so I like the Hokers. I like the Hoka Cliftons, uh, Hoka ones. I think they're really good to take because they've got a rocker bottom and mm -hmm. they help to take the pressure off. I think that with an orthotic, great. Yeah. Um, and I th obviously we tell we we tell ladies to reduce the height of the heel. Now, this can be an issue if you've got a lady that is vertically challenged that won't that won't change that won't change because it's it's a huge thing on their lifestyle so we've got to work around what they can do as um as our dear colleague ian griffith said uh in those people um injection treatment may be a suitable option um i do i mean we're going to talk about this in a minute i inject neuromas before COVID, I was doing I was doing a couple every week. Uh, and I was doing a lot, um, but it is, yeah, uh, it is quite. But yes, I must. I think you've covered everything. Orthotics. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Um, the idea of the orthotic is see see where that red pad is. You want to lift up behind the metatarsal, and then you want to have another pad at the forefoot to try and take pressure off the um off the second metatarsal or the or in between where it is a third or fourth metatarsal i think i i mean i don't know about you but i give ev everybody with the mortons gets an orthotic even if they have an injection they're getting an orthotic a semi-custom one not not custom made but they're all getting an orthotic what about you i think i think uh, i'm pretty much similar to yourself i uh, once you've assessed what is the cause factor for the neuroma and where footwear plays a massive role there's always there's other um, things which are affecting that as well. Uh, hypermobile feet, which has a lot of movement in it. Um, if you're moving in a particular sort of fashion, where uh, there's a lot of that movement in um, in between the toes. Uh, um, sometimes I've seen in abductory twist where uh, you when you're walking, you're basically uh, swinging the foot like that uh, every time. So you've got early heel lift going on. So all these things. Uh, uh, little abnormalities that I tend to, uh, if I find them, then I would correct them. But they definitely get the um, the Morton's pad. Uh, what I was going to say to you is that uh, now I have basically played around with the pad all the time. Uh, I've, uh, I've, for some people, it works right underneath the joint, just just behind or right underneath the joint. Um, for some people, they like it a little bit better uh, behind it. Um, I suppose the closer it is, the more splaying effect that it will actually have. And um, I've come across uh, one of the products by, I think, um, Taylor, not TaylorMade, uh, um, BioAdvance. And they've got these uh, little met pads, which are microfiber uh, grip. So you can literally just rip it off and reposition it, rip it off and reposition it. And I quite like that. I think uh, for me that has been a really big hit. Um, okay, I mean my my orthotic of choice for this um, is actually three quarter length. Uh, I like a three quarter length with the metatarsal pad to lift up the met heads. I've tried full length. I've tried it with the pad. It takes. It becomes patient compliance. It gets harder and harder the more space an orthotic takes in the shoe, and I have. I've dialed over the last 20 odd years I've dialed this back because I've realized there's there's no point of making the ideal orthotic if you're not going to bloody wear it so um I I've dialed it back but yeah you are right I mean having the metatarsal pad in the right place is is it's like obviously you have to have it in the right place yeah, um, have we, it's, uh, what I mean is that it suits different people different ways and some people like it right on the near, underneath the MTPJ, some people just like it a little bit behind. And uh, one of the uh, challenges, as uh, you mentioned, we do have with uh, the compliance. You, I have a little trade-off with the with the patient, and I say to them that I want you to kind of wear this as much as you can for next like six to eight weeks, and after that you can wear it when you are doing the activities, for example, walking. So. Uh, like footwear which uh, are for walking or running around and things like that 
can accommodate a full length device much more easily as compared to some of the devices, uh, uh, footwear that they actually wear. So my trade off with them is uh, usually wear it as much as you can for the next six to eight weeks. Um, and after that, wear it when you doing walking, when you going uh, um, training, when you basically running and stuff like that uh, uh, for added benefit. But uh, that, that's how I tend to get around it. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, completely agree. I want to, before I move on to the next slide, I'm going to add in one other thing. Okay. If, um, if I find the patient is a female who's been wearing high heels for a long time and I'm moving them from high heels to a flatter shoe, um, and often they have very tight calf muscles, I might give them a heel raise on both sides also, uh, because that may assist with uh, for, for them not loading up the forefoot too quickly okay. uh, would you is, is is that something that you would consider as well to see yeah if uh, if i've uh, in my assessment i pick up that there is a severe sort of shortage of uh, uh, their calf uh, muscles and they've got like a really aggressive uh, um, abductor twist because of all that uh, then uh, I, I would correct that okay uh, rehabilitation is not something we do a lot of. I think our screens are covering. Let me see if I can move this a little bit. Hey, yes. Okay. So I've just moved you down a little bit on my screen. Um, rehab generally consists, in my opinion, of just getting, um, just like massaging it, and just getting some, getting some stretch in the plantar fascia to help take the strain off the neuroma and the forefoot in general. Um, looking at the calves, which is what we just talked about, the uh, kinetic chain. If it's an athlete, I might go even up to the hamstrings. I might even go... This is something I'm going to talk about later when we start talking more about athletic um, conditions. So when we look at athletes, these are high-performance athletes, we look at slings. So not just one structure. We're looking at uh, various um, structures that are interconnected by fascia um, and that can start from the neck actually and move all the way down so um we we may be looking at further up the kinetic chain so we might be looking at further up in the body at the hips um but not if it's not an elite athlete i wouldn't be doing that mm -hmm. um there's an awesome podiatrist who's a top bloke called dave cashley he does something amazing which i've started to do he does mobilization so he grabs a third toe and he cracks it right um and he, he he you can hear the audible crack and it takes the tension off the neuroma it's not permanent but it can work well uh he's doing his phd on it but um i, I just thought that was fascinating so i put his i put a reference to him in there is there anything else i'm, I'm missing that? Yeah, for me, rehabilitation uh, comes in two ways. Um, I do do a little bit of mobilization for the foot, um, as well as the manipulation of the joints, uh, uh, which helps ease off uh, uh, the tension. Um, but uh, a lot of the time, rehabilitation consists of what you found elsewhere, which can be contributing toward uh, uh, the Morton's neuroma and rehabilitating that, strengthening it, um, working on that so that we can uh, um, we can assist with uh, less sort of loads or um, to reduce the contributing factors. That that's what my rehabilitation uh, consists of. Briefly, before I mean this is going off on a tangent a little bit. Did you go to the course for uh, Ted Jadina? I did. Yeah, Ted. Yeah, he he's he's like he's like a mad as a hatter, but he's great at what he does. Um, <laughs> Uh, I went to Milan to do his course there. Uh, uh, those were the days where you could go to Milan. <laughs> okay, yeah. injection treatment. Let me just move this along somewhere here. Now, okay. Um, do you inject this, Dosif? I do. I do inject it. And, uh, um, what's, your, what's, your, what's your cocktail of choice? And please don't say, my, my, don't say don't say like a pina colada. I'm talking about what do you inject into people? Uh, mine is fairly simple uh, with the uh, local anesthetic and uh, um, and methyl prednisolone. That's that's my preferred choice. Steroid. Yeah. Um, I completely agree with you. I do the same thing. I sometimes use a uh, true meal, which is a biotherapeutic agent, far less side effects, but 
I, I, th I find this really effective, especially if it's ultrasound guided. Yep. Uh, it, you can really get to the, you can really get to it. Um, they never, if, if a patient comes to me and they want an injection, they have to sign up to footwear changes and orthotics. Otherwise, I'm not doing just an injection. <laughs> They've got to do something else because the injection will give them a window of opportunity. Um, but yeah, I, I do the same as you. Yeah, I, I, I think it definitely makes sense, uh, doesn't it? That um, injections is great, but if you're not going to change the fact that why this is there and uh, um, if you're not going to change the contributing factors uh, to the neuroma, then all you're doing is just buying time and then after six months, it'll, it'll be back there again. Um, so you need to kind of be committed to uh, work on the other um, other treatment modalities as well for you to kind of get the injection. But injections tend to work really well uh, for it and uh, for immediate sort of pain relief and stuff, they do a good job. As well as there's, uh, there's some evidence, but I haven't come across a lot. I don't know whether you have or not, but, uh, but there's some evidence to say that uh, following the injection, the um, neuromas can actually shrink downward. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I know they become asymptomatic. You know, as we said before, a lot of people have neuromas, uh, but they're not causing them any pain. Yeah. I know from experience, once you inject a neuroma, it become it doesn't hurt anymore. Not to say it's not there anymore; it's just not hurting anymore. And as long as they've got their function better, um, that's the main thing. Yeah. Before I move on, to, before I move on to, to the next slide, I, I want to just just like state something very obvious. Um, many people think that extended skull podiatrists like me and Thosif are injection happy. We're not injection happy. Okay. Injection forms part of a treatment, of a holistic treatment plan, okay? Um, it's, it's never ever a magic bullet. Uh, and there are some colleagues, I wouldn't say colleagues actually, from other professions that inject, 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 and there's no, there's no view on a holistic plan. Um, as 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 people that see the whole body as one chain, we are often looking beyond just giving an injection. Ah, surgery. Let's move this over here. Look at this now. At a last resort, would you agree, Tafif? This would be a last resort. This is definitely a last resort. Uh, I think uh, uh, once the patients have gone through all the things I've been mentioned. Uh, uh, with regards to the orthotics, footwear change, injections, and everything else uh, that we can do for the neuroma, that's when uh, this would be considered. Definitely. Now, the reason why it is considered at the end is because you can have this taken out, but you can still have nerve damage and you'll have other horrible symptoms. Now, yeah. I'm not, I've, got, I've got no evidence to say everybody does but i know from anecdotally from speaking to the patients that have had it done they've had other weird symptoms that are like weird burning sensations and pins and needles not even the same the same symptoms so yeah i've, um, seen, so I've, seen, I've seen people with a very good uh, outcome uh, with complete resolution of their uh, problems i've seen people following the surgery with uh, very mild sort of improvement but um and i've seen people on the other side as well that uh, following the surgery their symptoms actually worsened and uh, they have constant long-term sort of paresthesia and uh, numbness and uh, stuff like that uh, okay cool uh, i think we both agree that surgery is an option it's not recommended um okay final thoughts now um Differential diagnosis, these are other things that it can be. We, we did go through the vast majority of them on the first slide. Uh, we didn't speak about them. Example cases. So, Steve, can you think of somebody on top of your head? Uh, for Morton's neuroma? Yeah. Yeah, I can. And so go I've got a patient who, um, I've got a patient who actually, uh, in fact, I need to do the video uh, con uh, consultation uh, uh, in a couple of days' time. Uh, uh, where uh, she had Morton's neuroma, uh, which was there. She's been to the NHS podiatrist like several times. Yeah. Is that interesting yeah. for me or? 
No, no, there's somebody else in the, in, in the background. Go on, carry on. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I just had somebody in the background opening the door as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, she's been to the NHS a few times. She's got like uh, lots of orthotics, uh, different types of orthotics. Not that I completely disagree with the, some of them, but one of the things that they didn't really consider is that uh, um, the consideration for the footwear and uh, stuff. She have the, um, she did have uh, um, an injection uh, injection done, which was uh, um, which was blind injection and. Um, so what we've done, what we were able to actually do is that uh, um, her calf muscles were incredibly tight. She had uh, a severe sort of abductor twist going on. So what we've done is that we've gone with uh, a bespoke orthotic, um, which is uh, with heel raises, as you mentioned, but they're going to be, I'm going to be removing them as, they, as uh, she gains more uh, um, strength and stretch uh, in, in her calf muscles. Um, with the uh, Morton's pad, but what we've done is that we've uh, injected her again uh, under uh, uh, ultrasound as well. And so far, um, she's doing great. Um, and like I said, I've got my second review to be done on uh, um, in a couple of days' time, and uh, I'll further know how she's getting on with uh, the orthotics. This is this is around three months now. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, I I see this very often uh, and rehab orthotics injection they're fine within 10 days um i i don't i very rarely see people that have failed in other places and then come to me but i have had a couple of those and those tend to get um, more aggressive orthotics uh and i might change the type of injection to a more high volume injection and i might do a series of injections rather than a single injection so i might do three injections over the course of a couple of months. Um, but yeah, I, it's something I see a lot of athletes. Athletes get this a lot, um, especially sprinters. Um, now, alternative treatment. There is a new treatment out on the market. Well, relatively new. It's, it first started off in the US. It's come to the UK. Uh, it's called a cryotherapy for this. Mm -hmm. And it's done on, it's like a minor skin operation, isn't it? So yeah. they make a cut, yeah? Uh, and then they put a probe in there, then they freeze it with like liquid nitrogen at minus 100 something degrees. I have no knowledge about this, so I don't really want to talk about it too much. I don't know if it's good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, I don't know if you have any more knowledge about this. Um, I, I came across this uh, when I was doing my ultrasound course, where uh, the consultant teaching us uh, works in Harley Street and uh, he talked about it very briefly. Uh, it's producing really good results. Uh, um, however, I haven't really come across uh, any papers or any evidence which states that uh, yet anyway. Okay. Cool. So, so um, one of the things uh, I think, I've, I don't know whether you've actually seen this, but people have started uh, doing shockwave on um, why would you ever do shockwave on a motor neuron? Well, I have I have heard about people doing uh, shockwave on it, and again, I don't know um, much evidence. Um, I, I haven't seen much evidence regarding it. I haven't really looked very hard enough anyway. I don't think shockwave should ever be done, but we'll talk about that later. So the final slide is me and Tosif saying thank you for listening to us for over one hour. Tosif can be the skinny one; I'll be the fat one because I am. <laughs> We well, are. Uh, at the moment, at the moment, I think I'm the first one because, uh, gosh, I've put on some weight. Yes, well, that's going to change soon. So, so see, next week, what are we doing next week? Um, I, I, I can't remember. So, what are we going to be talking we about? Are, we are doing heel pain oh, yeah. and ankle sprains. Uh, we are going to be doing that. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, heel pain, I think we've talked about it uh, in a video before, but I think uh, we'll try to make it uh, very patient-friendly and uh, um, stuff like that. Okay, well, thank you for listening to us. Well, thank you very much for your time, uh, Avid. That was amazing. Thank you. Take care.